Hi, my name is Caitlin and I'm a photographer. This diary is an account of the time I spent in the Falkland Islands and is where I urge all lovers of wildlife photography to make a pilgrimage at least once in their lives. The Falklands is pretty remote, about 300 miles off the coast of Chile, a long way from my home in New Zealand. But the payoff is that you get to experience a staggering variety of wildlife. I spent three weeks here and I got to shoot photos of four different varieties of penguins, elephant seals, sea lions, albatross, birds of prey such as skewers and caracaras, and a wide range of other birds. The camera I'm shooting with is a Canon 7D, with my preferred lens being a 400-600 to zoom. I'm travelling with a film crew who are shooting on a Canon 5D, as well as a Panasonic HD camera, which we use to shoot this film. We had a really good selection of lenses, which was lucky. You'll need to bring at least one lens capable of a wide shot, which I discovered the first time penguins began hopping all around me. We were based in Port Stanley, which is the main population base on the Falklands. It is probably one of the smallest and most colourful capital cities you could ever visit. There are plenty of great photo ops at Stanley, with interesting architecture and shipwrecks, and a nearby beach with lots of Maginot penguins, so plan to spend at least a few days here. From Stanley, we were able to fly in small planes to Outer Islands, which is where I found some really exciting photographic locations and wildlife. Our first destination was Saunders Island, which is famous for two great spots, the Neck and the Rookery. We would spend a couple of days here, staying in a self-contained cabin and sharing the Neck with thousands of Gentoo and Rockover penguins a small colony of king penguins, and the beautiful black-browed albatross. Just me and a film crew with this whole place to ourselves. It's hard to grasp the true accessibility of the wildlife at times. The penguins are just so unafraid and curious. The tourist code of conduct requires you to maintain a reasonable distance especially from nesting birds. But someone forgot to tell the penguins. If you remain still, the birds will come to you. For the photographer, this is paradise. Long lenses may be too long. Time to reach for the 28 mil. It was difficult not to be affected by the albatross. They are simply huge and completely unafraid of people. On the wing, they're graceful but they can land in a heap, so you need to be aware of the possibility that you might be in their flight path. These black-browed albatross are surely the fashion models of their species. They seem to invite us to photograph their chicks as if proud parents showing off. This was really magic. Now, you've probably noticed that I'm wearing full winter gear, even though we're traveling in late December, which is summer over here, it's really cold and very windy, despite the sun and blue sky. Good leggings are essential, not the least because you'll find yourself getting low, sitting or lying to get a steady shot, and the ground is covered with droppings. The whole time we're in the Falklands, it only rained a couple of times, but it was windy just about all the time. This was harder on the film crew than on me, but still, you'll want to pack good weather protection for you and the camera. While on Saunders Island, we managed to visit the first landing point of British settlers back in January 1765. Much of the outline of the original buildings can still be seen and is well worth a visit. It's hard to imagine arriving at this place and starting new life. Those people were very brave and true pioneers.
Our next destination involved quite a journey. We flew to West Falkland and then took a three hour overland trek. Driving off road is an essential skill here in the Falklands, so it's understandable why just about everyone has a 4x4, the most popular brand being a Land Rover. It's not long into the trip that you start to appreciate how huge the islands are and how much you miss roads. But the moment you arrive at White Rock, you realise you are somewhere special. The long overland journey over sometimes extremely challenging terrain ensures an exclusive experience. There is no chance of a busload of tourists arriving here and spoiling the peace. Here it is clear why this place gets its name. Generations of rock copper penguins and cormorants have left their mark. Reaching their nests is relatively simple for the cormorants, but for the rock copper, the journey is more difficult. Rock coppers are agile climbers. They have remarkably powerful legs, capable of propelling themselves over rocky terrain. Their goal is a nest at the top of the cliff, where clusters of chicks are waiting for a meal. It's a long way to travel to get a great photo, but really, it's pretty easy to get stunning shots, and the journey is half the fun. Once again, the penguins make it easy for you. Just be patient, and they'll be all around you within a minute or two. On the journey back, we stopped at an old farmhouse where we saw some owls. I've never seen owls before in the wild, so I found them fascinating. What strange creatures they are. One more great experience in the Falklands. We stayed overnight in West Falkland at Port Howard. What a beautiful setting! We really felt like we had gone back in time, and there were great landscapes to photograph. The people were so friendly, and they insisted on us joining them at their local that night, which they opened especially for us. The next day, we were invited to join most of the population of the island, only a few hundred people, at the annual Ram and Fleece Show held at another rural community, Fox Bay. While it looked like a good opportunity for an all-day party, there is a serious side to it as well. For the last 170 years, wool has been an important backbone to the Falklands economy. The wool is highly prized for its fine quality, no doubt as a result of the sometimes challenging climate. Winning the coveted prize for the best fleece really means something. Although there is still a lighter side to the event, guessing the weight of the sheep was my favourite. Later that afternoon, we flew to another small island called Carcass Island, which is named after a Royal Navy ship, HMS Carcass. Not all the dead carcasses you see on the beach, as many tourists surmise. Carcass Island is famous for a couple of things. The first is the hospitality of the owners of the island, who have a reputation for feeding their guests really well, which I can attest to. Mmm, homemade chocolate pudding with cream from cows on the farm. Yummy. The second reason it is famous is the small bird life that can be found here. The island is rodent free and so small birds thrive. They can be tricky to photograph, but we were told that dawn is the best time to try. So at 3.30am we got up to see who else would be up at this crazy time with us. I was surprised at how bright it was at that time, and staying in quite a small area of the beach, we were amazed at the variety of wildlife we could see. It was really lovely. Carcass is home for many caracaras, known locally as Johnny Rooks, and they love the chef out here, who often feeds them the bones of last night's dinner. One of the film crew, Kieran, was able to get up close to get these shots. He explains how. So this is a GoPro camera on the end of a telescoping carbon fibre rod, otherwise known as a camera stick. I use it to get into the face of some birds around here, particularly the caracaras, who are one of the rarest birds of prey in the world. They abound around these parts. 
Uh, the chef here likes to throw out old bones full of meat and they come and pick at it. This simple camera on a stick was actually invaluable at times and is worth considering when you plan your trip. We'll see more from Camera Sick later. From Carcass, we headed back to Stanley. Our hosts had told us about a couple of events happening over Christmas and New Year's that we might like to see. Horse racing traditionally takes place here on Boxing Day and is a great day out for everyone, including the kids. I've never really been a horsey person, but this was a lot of fun. The relaxed atmosphere and friendly locals offered plenty of photo ops, and you could even place a bet if you wanted. I'll bet a pound on these two to win, please. Ugh. The other big social event to watch was a raft race, which attracts a big field of hardy locals. You have no idea how cold that water is. Basing yourself around Stanley makes a lot of sense, as there are many great activities that can be done in a day. It is well worthwhile to follow the self-guided maritime history trail and learn more about the various shipwrecks to be found in the harbour. And within the town, there is an excellent museum to visit. You can learn a lot about the history of the islands here. Our host told me that you can borrow the keys to the lighthouse at Cape Pembroke from the museum. And so that's just what we did. The waters around Cape Pembroke have claimed many ships in the past two centuries, and visitors will have no doubts about why. This lighthouse dates back to the mid-1800s and was rebuilt in 1906. I did wonder if the real reason for the trip out here was for our host to show off his off-roading skills, again. Ah, uh, that does look quite steep. Oh. I know, if you can't get over it once, try again. Boys will be boys. One thing that strikes you when you visit the Falklands is just how friendly the locals are. We had no trouble starting conversations and making connections with all sorts of people. For most visitors here, the cruise ship is their gateway, and the local tourism machine is really good at dealing with the estimated 50,000 visitors each year. While we were in Stanley, we saw a huge ship arrive, but the funny thing is, that you didn't feel like your experience was ruined by the sudden influx of tourists. The place is just so huge, with so many things to see and do, that everyone can get the experience they want. A chance encounter with a local tourism operator saw us invited to Bluff Cove, with the promise of a fine dining experience afterwards. Once again, we packed ourselves into 4x4s and a short trip later discovered why this is considered a real gem by visitors. Here we found more colonies of gentoo penguins and a small group of king penguins. The chicks were like little kids behaving badly and crowded all around us, almost ruining the shots of the kings on their eggs. It's hard to be grumpy when you're surrounded by such cute creatures on the beach, all to yourself. If you're suffering from overexposure to wildlife, if that's even possible, the Bluff Cove Museum was really interesting. Later that afternoon, we visited the owner's home where we were treated to a fantastic meal in a wonderful setting. The chef here is renowned for her local cuisine, and we had such a brilliant time. When you come here, place this near the top of your must-do list. Our plan was to spend three weeks here in the Falklands, and with a week to go, I can hardly believe the huge variety of experiences we have enjoyed so far, with even more to come.
From Stanley, we took a short boat trip out to Kidney Island, where we had planned on photographing some sea lions on the beach and exploring the huge tussock grasses found there. As we were being ferried to the shore in our zodiac, the sea lions decided to come out to us instead. Surrounded by these curious creatures, we activated our camera stick and shot some wonderful film of the seals. What was supposed to be a two minute trip to shore turned into a magical half hour as we shared the ocean with the sea lions. It was a truly fantastic experience that I will remember for a long time. The next day, as a cruise ship departed Stanley, we decided to travel to Volunteer Point, a popular overland destination for passengers, due to the large king penguin colony there. With all the cruise people gone, it was a perfect time to visit. Once again, the journey there was half the fun, as we got to know the inside of a Land Rover again. In winter, this route is mostly closed because the ground gets so treacherous, but even in summer it was quite an experience. Volunteer Point is impressive. This was the largest colony of kings that we had seen, and they are important to the Falkland Island people. They have assigned a park ranger to this area to make sure the visitors do not disturb them too much, but still, you can get very close to a large number of birds. Apparently, kings are pretty terrible parents, and once distracted off the egg, they can forget to go back on duty so keeping your distance is very important. Even staying out of the strategically placed ring of rocks, there are plenty of great photos to be snapped. Our next destination was another small island called Sea Lion Island, which was simply beautiful. Small enough that you could walk to various vantage points to view wildlife, it offered a chance to walk off the delicious food that was served at the lodge. Given the name of the place, we first set out in search of sea lions, and we were very lucky to find a small pride with some freshly born pups. The high cliff gave a good vantage for photography, but we did need to be careful not to slip. Our hosts on the island told us about what they called the March of the Penguins, when thousands of gentoos come on shore each night to return to their hungry chicks. When we first arrived at the beach, it didn't seem like there were many penguins, but as if on cue, the numbers started rising fast. The best thing was to just sit and wait, and the march came right to us. Fantastic. That night, a strong wind came up, and was still with us the next morning as we trekked towards a cormorant colony, situated at the top of a very impressive cliff face. What a setting! The dramatic rocks, the huge swell, and of course, the wildlife. Getting some of these shots was actually a little bit scary, and the wind was also making it tricky for the cormorants to judge their landings. So far in our travels through the Falklands, we have always found the cormorants settled in with other penguins especially rock hoppers, but I guess that even rock hoppers will find it difficult to make it to the top of these cliffs. Trekking back to the lodge, we came across a rather comical sight of an elephant seal in mud. I guess it doesn't get much better than this for a seal. After nearly three weeks in the Falklands, we were almost ready to fly home, but not before we got a chance to tour the island and shoot some landscapes. This rugged land offers as much as the wildlife to the photographer, and some of the locations are just stunning. It was a great way to end our time here. When thinking about the whole experience of the Falklands, I think the best part was the accessibility of so many unique and varied experiences. I can't think of another place that offers so much to the photographer. 
getting a million dollar shot is so easy, it almost feels like cheating. Added to that, the warm and friendly people, and it becomes obvious. The Falkland Islands is where you want to be, again and again. I'll certainly be back.